Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to Morningstar, and thank you for attending today's executive forum on behavior economics. My name is Patrice Ijigemasalo. Don't worry, you don't have to uh, <laughs> spell my last name. <laughs> I am your uh, relationship manager here in uh, Montreal and Quebec region. I work with uh, Tara Brown over there, and uh, we're very happy that you're here. Uh, before we get started, let's quickly review a couple housekeeping items. After the panel discussion, we'll have a short five-minute break, and then a, a short presentation will take place, and some of you have already uh, registered to attend. Uh, Morningstar Ryan Murphy, uh, our panelist and director of behavior science, will present rethinking advisors as, beha as behavior coaches. Now let's move on to the panel discussion, <coughs> behavior economics, saving us from, from ourselves. Today's panel will be moderated by Morningstar Michael Kiesling. Mike, Michael is a head of uh, investment management at Morningstar Associate Inc. I will now hand it over to Michael to get today's discussion started. Thank you. Thanks, Patrice, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure for me to be here uh, and to speak with you. And on behalf of Patrice and Tara and Michael Lippman and the Morningstar team here in Montreal, uh, this is a very exciting topic uh, for us to talk about. If you're like me, and you finished your formal schooling more than a few years ago, what you knew about economics at the time was that uh, a person was homo economicus, a rational optimizer. Uh, as it turns out, uh, in, uh, maybe in the graduate departments of economics and certainly other disciplines, other things were going on. And we've learned a lot more about economics over the years. And we, we've seen it in the <coughs> Nobel Prizes that have come out. Uh, Danny Kahneman, who was a psychologist, earned a Nobel Prize in 2002 uh, in the areas of judgment and decision-making uh, under uncertainty. And much more recently, uh, only last week uh, exactly, uh, Dick Thaler uh, for his contribution to behavioral economics. So there is a move afoot uh, within economics uh, to change the way we think about how me people make decisions. And I'm very pleased to be joined by the panelists we have here today to expand on that topic. I'll give a brief introduction to them closest to me is uh, Ryan Murphy, who's Morningstar's uh, Director of, of Behavioral Science and, and has come up from our Chicago office to join us here today. Uh, on, the, on the farthest uh, side, uh, a local, Ken Lester, uh, who is not only uh, a professor at McGill University where he che teaches uh, applied uh, investments and behavioral finance, but also is a practitioner at Lester Asset Management. And then in the middle, uh, we have Jason Stewart, who is uh, from BE Works, a consulting firm uh, based out of Toronto, but of operations in many places. The first management consulting firm dedicated to the practice of, of applying uh, the behavioral science to strategy, marketing, operations, and other uh, challenges. So we have a very good and diverse uh, group to talk about this topic today. Uh, one thing <coughs> that I'd like to do, just to set the, uh, the stage going, so to speak, is to ask each of them maybe a little bit about to describe their role and their work as it applies to behavioral economics and maybe even in a little bit to talk about how they got into the field of behavioral economics in the first place. And why don't we start with Ryan? First of all, thank you. I'm honored to be here. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us. So where I started was an interest in psychology. And it wasn't the psychology of helping people who may have some sort of disorder. I wasn't interested in crazy people. I was interested in normal people. But normal people themselves were crazy enough to garner attention, <laughs> thinking about how people make decisions, how they use information. And so I started there in psychology and with a additional background statistics and mathematical modeling, then went into a business school, got a PhD essentially studying experimental economics. Uh, I was a professor. Uh, I was a professor in Switzerland for about seven years in the area of behavioral decision theory uh, and became more and more interested in doing consulting work in private wealth management applying what I was doing in academia to uh, industrial contexts. And that became what I now do full time. So I was recruited by Morningstar and joined them just last year as part of the team. Uh, so that's my convoluted path to where I am now. I think one of the most interesting aspects moving from academia to industry is taking this notion of how people make decisions and this contrast between <coughs> perfectly rational and people who aren't always that way. But then thinking about, given how we know those two things, how can we join them to help build context such that people can make better choices? And that's one of, I think one of the most exciting vistas out of this area, and hopefully something we'll touch on more in our discussions. Thanks, Ryan. Jason, what about you? Uh, 
Thank you also very much appreciate the opportunity. I started with a more conventional route, uh, the traditional economics training, and then going into capital markets, but was struck by the intersection of psychology with economics and finance. In particular, Robert Schiller's uh, theories were quite applicable to me in terms of the opportunities we'd often see for new bond issues. I worked for over two decades in capital markets and was struck to where inefficiencies could lead to better results. I then moved to an agent-based modeling firm, which is quite different than conventional macroeconomics. They build from the bottom up for these very in-depth, big data, big analytics-driven mathematical models. And then was pleasantly surprised by the opportunity to go to the Ontario Securities Commission, where I was the primary author of their behavioral insights report that published earlier this year. BE Works uh, was particularly impressive to me in the context of not only the first consulting firm for management, whether it was strategy, marketing, HR, or other aspects, but also in the fact that they'd done over 60 projects applying behavioral economics, whether it was in finance, energy, or other spheres. And their focus on experimentation really attracted me. It's a focus of my work there, whether it's with banks, insurance companies, or others making hypotheses, testing how these actions <coughs> work, and applying these to the often messy circumstances that we find ourselves in the real world. Thanks, Jason. And uh, Ken, why don't you tell us uh, a bit about yourself as well? I'll try and do it in a quicker fashion uh, than I did before. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I'm, I'm the child, of my mother was a, my late mother was a psychiatrist, psychoanalyst, and a professor here at McGill, and that's, uh, I'm an American, my father was American, we, I was born in the States, but we came here for my mother to be at McGill. <laughs> And uh, so I, I sort of grew up with a psychoanalytic or a psychological lean towards things, so always trying to sort of look behind what's really going on. I became a teacher, I taught in the States for a while, and then uh, decided to go back and do a PhD in history so I could teach university history, which was really sort of my joy. And uh, I, I, there's a long story, but I got into business, left the program, and started, uh, moved to Montreal, and had, um, um, started actually uh, a, a company that I sold, and then my father had um, uh, retired a little early from Alcan. He's an engineer, and his hobby was investing. So he said, "Why don't now that you've sold your company and I'm retiring, let's turn my hobby of investing into a little business?" Uh, so we did, and we created uh, what's today Lester Asset Management. Started around '87. And at the same time, McGill, uh, who knew that I was, uh, I, was a I became a licensed portfolio manager, and I had a teaching degree, and uh, they needed somebody who could uh, teach portfolio management. So they asked me, and I, so it's, it's since 92, I've been teaching portfolio management there. Then uh, one of my students in portfolio management uh, went to New York and around 2001, 2002, and wrote me this uh, long email saying, Ken, I'm sending you up this uh, book uh, I've never heard anybody in the world talk about investing the way you do, where you're always saying how human you know, uh, you know, decision-making is so flawed and so on. You have to read this book, and it was um, Taleb's Fooled by Randomness. And as soon as I read that book, it just sort of changed everything in my head. I then w looked at all the sources, read Kahneman, Tversky, all the, everybody else who he referred to, and it really just changed my whole, uh, I called up Taleb and invited him to Montreal, and he's quite a character. I won't go into that now. But anyways, all to say that uh, um, I then went on a um, sort of a mission to get McGill to accept behavioral finance. And they kept saying, no, 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 it belongs in the li you know, liberal arts. If you want to go teach psychology, go ahead. And you know, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't belong here in business school. We're, you know, we're, we're different here. So at, at one point, McGill had needed me for something because of my license for this honors program. So I said, aha, I have leverage on you guys now. I'll do, I'll do the honors program, but you have to let me now teach behavioral finance. So they said, OK, OK, we'll give you a little topics course. You can have, we don't know how many people will do it. And you'll have some MBAs and BCOMs together because we're not sure it's going to be. And then a week later, they called me up and said, could you do two? Because there's so many BCOMs that want to do it. It's squeezing out the MBAs. And now it's, uh, this has now been my fifth year teaching it, and it's now become one of the most popular. I mean, it's, it's, it's oversubscribed, like in five, ten minutes, uh, you know, uh, the, the day it becomes open, uh, both at the MBA and BCom level. And it's not me, it's the subject matter that's so interesting. Well, it certainly is, and we're going to delve into <coughs> that. It's always good to hear people's origin stories, how they came into this field, because we perhaps didn't grow up with it. But let's dive right in uh, to a couple of the most, maybe one of the most powerful behavioral concepts that you can think of 
as it applies to what you do. Uh, Jason, why don't we start with you, if you can give us one of those concepts. It's uh, certainly a wide range of choice, but for us, we find it's information overload and choice overload, in particular as it applies to financial markets. If you think about the amount of willpower as well as attention and cognition just used from an ordinary shopping trip, that it ends up depleting our cognitive resources to a surprising extent. And one of my favorite examples is research into the car purchasing, where there's actually 57 decisions involved online with a car purchase in recent years. And the studies show just how cognitively depleting that is as people allocate more and more of their resources up front to the initial decisions versus what happens later in the process. For me, when you take that just from a basic shopping expedition, you probably more sophisticated for a car, but apply that to financial markets where you have so many behavioral aspects from complexity, which is very difficult for most people, <laughs> numeracy requirements for the estimates of risk and uncertainty, credence goods whereby we don't find out for a number of months, years, or even decades where things are going, add in such factors as the say-do gap, that is the gap between our implementation as well as our intentions, and then factor in the challenges of time discounting for having to wait what we consume up front versus later on. That combination of the bewildering array of information that we face and the amazing range of choices is particularly interesting. Ken, what about you? I mean, what's the number one concept you might be talking with your students about? Well. Uh, it, it, it struck me as a portfolio manager mostly that uh, the endowment effect is something that I see every day you know, with my clients and with uh, my traders and with myself even. And in fact, I, I don't even want to trade my own account. I have one of my up partners trading my account because uh, you know, I'm too, I'm too, uh, I fall in love too easily with my winners especially. But anyways, the, the, I find the endowment effect is the most powerful. And I have an example where a client bought uh, uh, this was on his own, actually. He bought uh, a large position in a very, uh, in a 15 cent company. And it, within a few months, it went to $1.50. And I said, okay, you, 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 I don't care about the merits of the company. You've got to lighten up your position because of concentration issues. Nothing to do with the merits of the company. And, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't sell. And I said, okay, let's pretend you had cash today. Would you be buying these shares at $1.50? And he goes, no way would I pay $1.50. I said, well, how much would you pay, you think? He says, maybe 30 cents. I say, so there's a, you own something that you would only pay 30 cents for, and now it's, you can sell it for $1.50? Can you imagine what's wrong with that picture? And uh, that, you know, even smart people, uh, to this day, he, st he calls me up, he goes, you know, uh, there's something in what you said, but I still don't want to sell the shares, you know? So. <laughs> It's funny, we, when we first started thinking about behavioral finance, it was always, uh, talking about it in the industry, it was always about retail clients and them. But as it turns out, it's all of us who are subject to it. So yeah, it's, a, it's a good story. Ryan, what about you? What, what cro crops up for you the most? I think for me is that there is an orderliness to people's quirkiness. And so what is easily dismissed as, oh, that's just irrational behavior, is, is I think it really misses an opportunity. So what happens if you start to take behavior seriously, start to do experiments or look at field studies, and start <coughs> to look at the ways in which people are making choices, and then you just assume for a moment that they are acting rationally, perfectly rationally. It's inconsistent with your model, but what are you gonna believe, your model or the behavior? And so I think that a lot of the progress that's been made in behavioral economics is to take a step back and taking seriously what people are choosing, and then trying to have a better understanding of maybe they're motivated differently than we think, Maybe they believe different things. Maybe they're trying to accomplish something we don't have in mind, but to take seriously the behavior. And so the structure, the orderliness of this quirkiness is something that I think is starting to emerge and something that I, I find to be a very powerful unifying concept. Okay. Some of the concepts that the, you've mentioned thus far uh, from, from the panelists are ones that perhaps make intuitive sense. There are a number perhaps that don't make as much intuitive sense on the, perp on, on the surface just wondering if there are any that stand out to you in that regard that aren't immediately apparent but, but have some depth to them. And Jason, why don't we start with you? Sure. I find it interesting as someone who has uh, worked with a number of advisors over the years and been impressed with their empathy as well as their skills, the situation whereby regulation and policy can create unintended uh, situational deficiencies where we lead people to behave absolutely against their best interest from the requirements for disclosure, specifically the conflict of interest. 
uh, numerous studies in this regard, particularly by Lowenstein, but what's quite fascinating is not only has it been proven to not be as successful as intended, in many cases it actually backfires. Starting with the client side first, after disclosure, there's what's called the panhandler effect, where people are very reluctant not to provide business or to take the advice out of sympathy for being there in person. There are the issues with respect to dense and complex information, the typical agent principle problem, which is also the case in medicine and law, not just in finance, which again restricts independent choice. But what was fascinating was when the experiments were actually run and they tested disclosure, which led to a decrease in clients' views of their trust of the advisor, they still took the advisor's advice when they were in front of the advisor. If, however, they were in a separate place and informed that the advisor would not be told of their decision, the vast majority of them rejected the advice. Even on the advisor side, and again, I stress how many of them are quite good that I've dealt with, there's the issue of moral licensing, whereby with disclosure, you've now surrendered your need to be reflecting purely the client's effects. You've already disclosed this, they're fully informed. There's also the issue of overcompensation. If the client is perceived to be discounting my advice, I then have to overcompensate by making that advice stronger or making stronger recommendations than I otherwise would have intended. Wow. Ken, any counterintuitive ones that you can uh, share <coughs> with us? Yeah, I'm not sure if counterintuitive. I'm, I'm, I am I, uh, continually blown away by how powerful priming is, especially when priming uh, it, it can be completely random, a number, you know the famous uh, Kahneman test where he has people spin a wheel of fortune and the number that they come up with somehow has a bearing on how tall the tallest trees get or how many you know, <laughs> African countries are in the UN. And so that kind of thing just continually amazes me and it, it seems to me that that alone is enough to, anybody who doesn't believe in what we're talking about sh should look at those studies alone and, and just see how powerful. And also I think what Ryan said before uh, was is counterintuitive to me is the is the predictability of the quirkiness is the is and in fact again another great reason to study this and if if our quirkiness was completely random there'd be no value in studying it because there would be no way to to adjust or or benefit but because it's so predictable and and which I wouldn't have predicted you know right. at the beginning uh, there is uh, it is very valuable to learn okay and just to finish the thought Ryan on counterintuitive uh, ones any that stand out for you. So there's, so I think it's the unintended consequences to build on the, the points you were making, which is that by trying to help people out, we could actually make things worse. So we did a study recently where we were looking at how the disclosure of fees can influence people's decision making by trying to make the cost of two different ETFs much clearer. One of them was really expensive, one was cheap, and they were basically the same thing. They were both S&P trackers, and the correlation between them was 0.999. I mean, it was you know, basically the same thing. But one of them cost 10 times as much as the other. The thinking is, let's make that really obvious to people, and there's just a clear choice. Don't donate your money to a banker, right? But by making the information more salient, people were just as likely to buy it, if not more likely to buy the expensive one. So this backfires in a way, and what people may be using there is this is a signal of quality. So it's more expensive, ah, it must be good, right? So they have a simple heuristic in mind that might work in certain retail environments, but in an investing context is disastrous, especially in 30-year accumulation. So this idea of that there can be unintended consequences, what seems like a really good idea, and if you take only the vantage point of homo economicus, you give the right information, you show how there's a clear trade-off, it's obvious what people are going to choose. It's not so obvious. Could you send some of those clients my way? <laughs> <laughs> the ones who don't mind paying higher? <clears throat> there's, uh, there's been a lot of head nodding in, in the crowd as, as you describe some of these things, and, and perhaps within this room, uh, we have a general acceptance of, of behavioral economics as, as a contributor to how people make decisions. But Ken, I wanted to ask you in particular, but I will get to the other guys as well, uh, has it truly hit the mainstream? You alluded to the fact that you had to struggle with, with, uh, with McGill. Is it truly a mainstream thing? Are there still pockets of resistance? Where would that be and oh. why? And uh, yeah. you know. There are absolutely still pockets of resistance. Uh, uh, even. Uh, I'm not showing off here, but I, I email back and forth with Kahneman a lot, and uh, he's amazed that I got McGill to accept behavioral finance. I mean, and we gave him an honorary doctorate. Uh, you know, it's, uh, 
Yeah, and the reasons are very clear. It's the lady doth protest too much. It's uh, the people who have the most to, are most threatened by this information are the ones who are fighting, you know, pushing back as much as they can. And who are they? They're PhDs in finance whose dissertations were all based on the models where, you know, the assumptions being that we're all, uh, you know, uh, logical decision makers and we always choose the right path, uh, you know, in our own selfish uh, best interest and so on. In fact, if you, if you don't use those models, just about all financial theory break, you know, falls apart. So it's, uh, you can understand why they're, they're, they're against it. And they didn't learn it in school, so they figure, you know, oh, these young upshots are you know, teaching this new stuff or whatever. It's, so there's, a, there's definite resistance to it. And uh, it's not, it's, I would say there are more universities against it than for it. I mean, it's not, it's, we're the minority, I, uh, it, 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 it seems to me. Ryan, what's your take on that? You've been in academia and now you're in mm -hmm. practice. I, I think my take, I, I sense that there's resistance and there's also just disinterest to it. So I, I don't know that I've experienced as much hostility as you're describing, but some of the departments I was in were purposely much more behavioral and I chose that. So I sampled into an environment that was going to be nicer <laughs> to me, right? Um, but I, I think that, well, there's the old joke in academia that intellectual progress occurs one funeral at a time. And this is just slow going, and in part because the models that do make these assumptions about perfectly rational decision agents and highly efficient markets make things so much easier. And, and if you let go of that, then you have to start to stipulate, okay, well, in what way are people limited in their attention or how they can use information or how do their risk preferences change? Things become much more complicated. And the, the incentives in academia aren't quite lined up for that. So mm -hmm. it's publish or perish, and you have to lots of quick little papers which may or may not have anything to do with reality. But I think in the long run, this is going to win. I think there's been enough of a critical mass and enough people interested in this. So I would expect within, I don't know, I would be hesitant to put a number of years on it, but at some point we're just going to be talking about, not talking about behavioral economics, just talking about economics. And I, I think we're headed in that direction. Jason, anything to add in that regard? Yes, I'll focus on the, the academia that well covered, so I'll focus a bit on business and then on the regulatory policy side. Uh, in the business side, it would be our view that they're far ahead, but it's very uneven by sector and by firm. Certainly the FANG group, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google, extremely sophisticated. We're seeing some very impressive work by fintechs, whether it's, you know, the, the Well Simples, Nutmeg in the UK, Betterment in the US. Uh, some pretty rapid progress by banks and insurance companies and things like Smartfolio. But the key to all these is very active ongoing testing, not just randomized control trials and uh, A-B testing, but pretty active engagement and commitment to experimentation. Would not make that same statement about government and the regulatory sphere. Uh, there's a more of an understanding, uh, so quasi-white papers, there are certain initiatives which show that but there really is not the focus on the last mile. It's a book by Dilip Soman, which I recommend to everyone here, and that is what happens not just with policy and regulatory strategy and design, but what happens in the last mile with firms delivering that and also what clients actually receive. And choice architecture is really key there to overcome barriers of cognition, but also in terms of uh, various other issues, especially the say-do gap, but it's clear that uh, regulators haven't yet fully accepted that better choice architecture can help with legal approaches in terms of compliance. It can help with economics in terms of making incentives more salient. And it can also help in terms of information, not just the salience and simplification. So directly and indirectly, there's a lot of scope for far more use in government and by regulators. Okay, thanks for that. And we've already kind of covered a lot of ground in, in behavioral economics, so I wanted to kind of warm the crowd up, so to speak, uh, with, with, with your comments and go to you, you, and I will do this again before we're done. Any questions from, uh, from the audience right now for any of our panelists that you can think of? Yes, sir.
how do you create a context for your behavioral economics or behavioral finance in the context of sleep hygiene? Do you have no idea? I have that. <laughs> no, 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 I was just asking in terms of uh, yeah. trying to be somewhat gentlemanly in terms of offering to others to go first. I, I would say three things in that regard. One, behavioral economics is not a, not a panacea. It's a crucial ingredient with that. And two, I, I do think it's going to be an amalgam of various approaches in that regard. I do believe markets are informationally efficient, not necessarily price efficient, but informationally efficient in that regard. The weighting on that information, other aspects, we can debate when we get the fear of missing out, belief, confirmation biases, extrapolation. The second aspect I would point to as well is I'm not, uh, while <coughs> algorithms and things are incredibly powerful aspects, I do believe behavioral aspects are also key where you have what El Arian refers to as jump conditions. And we've seen that with Brexit, the US election, and others, where all kinds of market structural and interrelationships completely broke down when you get something that's far beyond a three standard deviation event. And in that, I would go back to Jagaranzer, who writes extensively about risk and uncertainty where you can have machine-based approaches which are very effective in the one, whereas humans are much better than the others. So it's a long way of saying that's a very complex question. I do think you have to have an augmented approach, and I do think you have to be quite eclectic in terms of your willingness to have a particular approach, but then change it if circumstances radically alter, which I believe we've seen in a number of instances over the last two years, and I believe going forward will be an increasing challenge. Any As part of it, yes. Yes, it's going to be a mix, but I've let my other panelists yeah. respond to this. I, I, I would just add to what Jason said that there's certainly no all-encompassing way of doing things. Uh, you know, I have clients who come to me and I start asking them, you know, the know thy client stuff, and, and then all of a sudden uh, they say, stop, I know what you're doing, you want your fine. I want your portfolio, Ken. You know, it's as if somehow I have the best portfolio in the world and everybody else, uh, you know, it's subpar. And I say, you know, you don't want my portfolio because it does things that may keep you up at night, but, but, but it's that concept that somehow there's this body of knowledge out there that, that in, takes into account all the possible variables and things that are going on. And in fact, if anybody ever tells you that they've come up with a model that takes into account all the things you talked about, you know, you should run in the other direction. Uh, so. <laughs> Any other questions from the audience right now before we move on to some others? Okay, well, why, do, why don't we do that? But l l let's talk a little bit more specifically about investments here. And, and there's a lot of research that shows that there's a difference between the returns available to an asset class or a particular investment and the returns that investors actually end up experiencing. And, and one thing that we, we call that is the behavior gap. Uh, and that gap is typically not in investors' favor. Uh, what are some of the, the, the behavioral economics concepts that could be behind that, number one? But perhaps more importantly, what can be dr done to address that and close that behavior gap? And perhaps, Ryan, we'll start with you on that. Sure. So th the behavioral economics concepts that could drive this, I, I would highlight two. The first is going to be loss aversion, which is simply stated that losses hurt more than gains feel good. So people are really sensitive to downside risk. And so when markets become more volatile, people are much more likely to then start to move and try and meddle in their portfolios and change things. There's an additional notion we've been working on in the research team, which is this idea called risk reactivity. So there's lots of work that's exist in behavioral economics looking at measuring people's risk preferences. But what we're interested in is what's the stability of those preferences in a person over time. So to put it in really blunt nomenclature, this is the probability of a person freaking out. <laughs> right? They might be risk averse. Uh, but do they stay risk averse when markets become volatile? That's an interesting question. This person is risk tolerant. Do they stay that way? And so it's a second order notion that builds on the idea that different people have risk preferences. Sure, we can measure that. But let's start to think about ways in which we can measure people's stability of those preferences as information changes. I think that could be one of the big drivers in this persistent behavioral gap you highlight. I mean, we're talking about one to one and a half percent return per year that can be attributed to people shooting themselves in the foot. Jason, what's your uh, take on that? I would add to that because it's interesting uh, with the work on reactions to it. So this composure work that's also yep. been uh, highlighted by the Plan Plus group uh, for some of the work they did for the OSC's investor advisory panel. And we think that's also where some of the most productive work can be done. 
because it's one thing to be having a latte or sipping tea and having cookies in an advisor's office or with your fund representative. It's another thing from mid-2015 to early 2016, watching a large decline in the markets with what the media is doing as well as the social block. So we happen to believe in that, that there's a, an ability to personalize and make it concrete so that the question with respect to risk becomes far more tangible to people in that regard. The second aspect, and uh, Meyer Statman does this uh, very, very well, he asks people to forecast over the next 12 months what the market will look like so they can identify regret aspects as compared to risk aversion. And the third aspect I'd look at is that even our basic concepts of measuring risk are deeply flawed. Uh, we did a study in 2014 that showed all you have to do is move the choice set when you're handing this to a retail advisor and you get very different responses. So if you give someone the standard low, medium, high choice set, and then you introduce an extremely high risk-oriented portfolio, the vast majority of retail investors will move their choice to the middle upwards and they'll become much more risk-prone. If you then turn around and introduce an extremely low risk, low return option, they will move down hmm. their choice in the middle. Hmm. If you frame it as a loss, they will be more risk averse in their answers. If you frame it as a gain, they'll be more risk oriented. So we called our study, it depends how you ask, mm. but framing really matters. Mm. Mm. And then Ken, as a practitioner, I mean, when you're working with clients, how can you help them? Well, my fee, that's what they, <laughs> that's what they blame for the discrepancy. But uh, no, the, um, I, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, what the, both gentlemen have already said. And uh, uh, the only thing I would add is there's a great study, and I think it was Morningstar, or somebody like Morningstar who did this study many years ago, where they took a five-year period and they said, okay, uh, they looked at the 200 biggest mutual funds in the States, and this was in the 80s, I think, when there weren't that many, and the 200 biggest mutual funds in the States basically was all the money. And they said, okay, what did, the, what did these 200 mutual funds do in the last five years? Well, they were up about 10% compounded annually. Now, let's actually look, and this you can do this, you can data mine with mutual funds that you can't do with individual stocks, because there isn't the record keeping with individual stocks when people actually get in and out, but with, with uh, mutual funds there are. So they could actually see the day that each, in the, each, per, each client of these 200 mutual funds, which obviously millions of people, when they actually got in, when they got out, and how, the, how they did. So in this environment, obviously if you did a weighted average study of all the individuals, it would work out to 10% annually. It has to mathematically. But let's now forget about the weighted average. Treat everybody as one individual. So whether it's a, a little old man at 90 buying one unit of a mutual fund or some big pension fund buying a whole bunch, they're all treated equally. The average performance in this five-year period was negative. It's unbelievable. And, you know, people, well, that's impossible. How could it be? Well, there's only one reason it can be, and what these gentlemen just said. We zig when we should zag. We, we're always late to the party. We're the, you know, the trend is your friend. And so we're jumping in when we read in the paper and the market, you know, uh, how could you be so stupid as not to own Google? How could you be so stupid as not to own Facebook? So what do people do? They jump in at the top. And, and where do they sell when their stomach hurts and they can't take it anymore when they should be buying? So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty, that's compelling. And if that stat alone should convince everybody that behavioral finance is so important to learn. And with the new disclosures this past year in Canada for mutual funds, the CRM2, with the time-weighted versus money-weighted rates of return, I think some of that discrepancy between what a fund delivers and what the client experiences might, might come into a pretty stark relief. So... Uh, it might be a sign for them. Let's uh, take an opportunity for a second to go back to the audience, see if there are any other questions that have popped into, uh, into people's minds right now. And I will do this one more time before we're done. Okay. Well, there are folks who are uh, from various uh, backgrounds who are in the, uh, in the audience today. And I wanted to, to ask questions really a little bit with them in mind because it's not just investors who, uh, we want to help investors, but we, we can't just think as investors. We have to think about where we're coming from. Uh, for example, professional investment managers. There are portfolio managers, analysts uh, in the room right now. We're human too. Uh, how can portfolio managers and investment analysts avoid falling prey to poor behavior? Ryan, what's, uh, what's your take on that? I'll, my brief answer would be that just being aware is useful as a first step. It's necessary to be aware that there are these certain limitations, recognizing that the brain is in many ways evolved and wired not to make good decisions about money. 
Uh, but that by itself I don't think is sufficient to help people. I think there's some tips and tools that are, can be more concrete to help nudge people towards making better decisions, automatic kinds of things, having them pre-commit uh, these kinds of firm plans. Uh, and other ways in which to frame the decisions in terms of their particular goals rather than versus benchmarks to make it more personal. And also to try and keep people thinking about the long term, that this is not quarter to quarter or even day to day returns. This is a 30 year process. I think those are useful ways to try and nudge people to make better decisions and overcome their uh, worst tendencies. Ken, you are a portfolio manager. And you had mentioned a little bit earlier, uh, you know, about your own reticence about particular stocks and your, your, your colleague. Is there anything that you could counsel other portfolio managers to do or not do uh, hmm. in their specific job? Well, just like a doctor should never operate on his own children, I've, I've taken that <laughs> advice and I have uh, my other, my partners manage my own portfolio and my children's portfolio and so on. I think that's in a way, like Ryan said, we're, you know, if we know, if we know some of our cognitive, the mistakes we make, we can make adjustments for it. Uh, Kahneman talks about thinking like a trader, and I think that uh, if, if all of you if, you, if you read nothing else, you should read Thinking Fast and Slow, uh, anybody who's a professional, because just that chapter alone, thinking like a trader, can help you. Uh, and that one of the main things there is the broad view. Because of our loss aversion, and you know the agency effect, you guys must, or some of you must know about it, where you know individual agents within a company can be making the decision based on their own uh, wet survivability and so on. And, and, they'll, and they'll forego a lot of um, you know, 55 or 60 percent positive situations because they can't afford the downside, they're out of a job. Whereas the, the company head wants everybody to take those 60 percent chances, knowing that the company will win more than it loses and so on. So same thing as a trader. You cannot look, you can't be happy when you trade and you make some money, or you can't be sad when you trade and lose some money. Otherwise, you're doing this emotional roller coaster. You've got to say, I have to look at the broad view. I have to say, I'm going to win 60% of the time or 55% of the time, and I'm going to lose 45% of the time, and, and, you know, uh, and that's great. Uh, they, they'll, I'll, be, they'll, I'll be on the cover of Time magazine if I keep doing that that's for right. a while. Yeah. So you, know, you, you have to be prepared for losses and not get upset when you have losses. And, and, and I think the endowment effect also, you have to, you know, uh, at Dick Thaller's firm, Fuller Thaller, they, they run a behavioral fund, and there they have no, the, the buying team is different from the selling team. So the selling team doesn't even know uh, the price paid for a stock. They're kept completely in the black. So all they do is look every day at that stock and say, should, is this, if we had this money today, should we buy this particular stock? That's a very good discipline. Another discipline in, related to that is imagine that you've sold the portfolio every night. Now, let's say you have a million dollar portfolio. Imagine that the night before you sold it and now you have a million cash. Would you buy this exact portfolio that's sitting in front of you? And if the answer is no, then you should sell and, uh, and make adjustments. Thanks for that. And Jason, with professional portfolio managers, any advice for them or how? I think a couple of aspects. One, uh, just to preface it, that uh, everyone always talks about it being extremely difficult to invest, but we're coming into two transformational aspects that have already started. One, we've never been part of central banks unwinding over 10 trillion of assets on their balance sheet. And two, uh, there were some very good studies back in 07 through 09, in particular like Rogoff's talking about it being five or 10 years before we could rebound out of this extremely slow growth we'll notice. What does that mean for inflation? So if I'm a portfolio manager right now, I'm looking at, am I anchored in the current period of lo ultra low interest rates? I'm ex am I extrapolating with respect to the value of asset prices? Very good article by The Economist two weeks ago in terms of everything being overvalued. But I'd also come back to the trader because it's a very good analogy. I was fortunate to work with three great traders at three different firms. And it's not official research, but it's interesting with some of the larger ones. The top trader is in that 60 to 62% sort of where they're accurate. And their distinguishing feature to me is their ability to have well articulated to themselves, well founded views of the market that they can switch in half an hour. <laughs> not every day, not every week, not every month, but they're willing to say the props, the foundations of that view have so fundamentally changed, I've got to move. And they don't have the regret bias for what they're trying to sell. They're not bound by the endowment. They've seen it through the cycle. So it's easy for me to say sitting up here, but I've unintentionally started to help a few people uh, in this regard in terms of their own personal portfolios, unofficially. 
Ask about your belief biases. Check your confirmation bias. What is it today that you think is continuing from before? And bring in some people with totally contrarian views. Construct it. Because that's the best way to test your views. Okay. Some good insight there. Let's, let's take another role in the industry, maybe somebody a little bit closer to the client, a client-facing retail advisor. Uh, so they may not be making the individual investment decisions. Somebody else uh, might be doing that. But they're the ones who have the relationship with the retail advisor or with the retail investor. Ryan, how, how do you think that these, having an understanding or a training in this can help them? So I think part of it is being able to construct a narrative that the client can understand and, and identify with, that this is not just a cognitive process that's cold and balance sheet. There's an emotional component here. So I think one of the ideas that we come across in the group is this notion of goal-centric planning, trying to understand why a person is investing. I mean, really fundamental questions. Why are they actually taking a risk with their resources now and not consuming and putting that off to later? And thinking about that as being the touchstone for what they do. And so it's not comparison to a benchmark. They're not trying to beat the market. What they're trying to do is make sure they develop a long-term strategy that actually is sufficient with a good probability to meet their goals and then help them understand what that entails, that there are real trade-offs between, OK, that's a very ambitious goal. That's going to take a very ambitious kind of investing. That's going to be very aggressive positioning. Can you tolerate that? And start to show people what that trade-off is, and even put it in concrete terms. If, if you think that ride is going to be too bumpy, if you can contribute $500 more a month, you can smooth it out this much. Are you willing to buy yourself that much more of a smooth ride? And so I think these kinds of concrete examples, trade-offs, are helpful for people as they start to think through this. But I think the overarching one is to make sure that the context of why is a person investing in the first place is essential. They have a goal and they're, they're on their way to meet it. Okay. Uh, Ken, I mean, in, in the nature of your asset management business, you maybe are the advisor as well as the portfolio manager. Do those, does that ring true to you, that relationship with the Well, client? we're discretionary, so yeah. it's not quite the same um, okay. situation, I guess, uh, yeah. where we don't have to discuss the actual investment with the client, although right. we discuss performance with them afterwards mm -hmm. and things like that. So, yeah, I mean, I would, I would, I would agree with uh, what Ryan said there. Okay, and Jason, any particular oh, insight there? One pick up on Ryan's theme where uh, an advisor has two components. One is uh, the long-term one, the benefits that we're seeing from de facto being a nudge advisor, encouraging more savings encouraging a focus on financial planning. The research is quite early, but already we're starting to see pretty significant benefits from long-term behavior with that. I would also say a different approach to literally from the engagement uh, with clients that should be, again, augmented both in terms of in-person contact, but also in terms of the online contact, literally from when they start with them, having them fill out the questionnaire <coughs> online as well as in person. We know from the anonymity effect you get much more information when someone fills something out online, provided they're sufficiently computer savvy to do so. <laughs> the disinhibition effect and what they'll disclose, even things like having them sign up front on documents not only makes it more ethically salient, it does mean that we get more information than if they signed at the very end of the document. <laughs> I never heard that one. <laughs> so that's actually studied by two of our co-founders, Nima Nadar and Dan Urelli, <laughs> on that uh, with several, uh, several others. But the one that I think is particularly key is communication during market downturns. And there's some robo-advisors in the US who've done this very, very well. It's tough physically to reach more than about 20 clients a day during a difficult market. You just can't, you can't get them that easily. You need half an hour or so to walk through. Whereas you can tailor with your message, 500, 1,000, X thousand, to be able to say, here's your portfolio. Here's what's happening overall in the market. Let's look at the last 30 years for 87, 94, 98, 2000, 02, 07, 08, and get them to start to focus on the longer term. We know that's where the biggest trigger is, and we know that to, from our perspective, where the best role for an advisor can be. Hmm. Well, let me just add that uh, what Jason just said is very, very important, uh, especially during when the client's seeing in the news these arrows, you know, market, you know, another record loss, and, so I used to get calls in 08 and 09, clients, as soon as I would get on the phone, they'd go, okay, that's, I just wanna make sure you haven't jumped out the window. And so the hand-holding or the at least knowing that we're not panicking and that even though the world seems to be panicking, they take a lot of comfort that the person who's in charge of their portfolio is not panicking. And so very important to communicate that. And I think there are a lot of uh, folks in the room who may have some form of marketing and communication role 
at the firm uh, they're at. So maybe we should dig a little bit deeper into, into that as well. I mean, not just in the, let's call it the, the big downturns in the market, but there are any advice that you could give them in general for positioning their marketing and their communications uh, to clients who they might be far removed from. And Jason, why don't you continue on in the, the topic? Very good papers by the UK's Financial Conduct Authority, uh, one on a discussion paper on writing for clients rather than for your legal department or compliance. <laughs> easy for a regulator to say that when quite often they're the source of having yeah. to write in, in that way. So I, it definitely has to be a balanced perspective. But they've gone further and created a sandbox whereby they will bless best practices in terms of that communication. So it's simplifying, making salient, chunking the information up front. There's a great study that they did of consumers who failed to claim redress, that is failed to get money back. So this is their second one. They did a randomized controlled trial back in 2014 very clear on what you can do with better messaging. They've also written a very good piece uh, on behavioral insights into the marketing of financial products. Uh, it just came out in April of this year and they create something called see, interpret, and act. And it's very good running the entire behavioral journey from uh, attention, perception, cognition, <coughs> action, and whether it's sustained behavior. And want to build those in and test them pretty clean circuit. Ryan, anything to add in the communications marketing side? I know Morningstar does a lot of work in that regard. Yeah, but I wanted to build on the point you were talking about as being a touchstone for calmness. I think that's really valuable. It's like when you're flying and the plane starts to encounter a lot of turbulence, you look to see how the flight attendant is dealing with it. Right? If he or she is relaxed, you're like, okay, good. But I worry when they worry. <laughs> right? And I've been on flights Thanks, before. Flights where, at five. Right. Where, yeah. where they're the ones who look really nervous. And at that point, go like, okay, maybe that's a signal. Right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that people are looking for that kind of feedback and that kind of reinforcement. And I think that that's part of what good financial advice can provide. It's not just information, but it's a kind of behavioral coaching to say, nope, this is what we expected. This is the kind of volatility that you're going to encounter in a 30-year run. So this is normal. Hang in there. This is, you're still on target. And I think that's very valuable to keep a lot of people even keel and on track. Can anything add in the communication? Yeah, just, um, I, I was thinking while Jason was talking that I, well, it's a summer job and I was selling, um, in the States, I was selling um, solar panels, believe it or not. It was like one of the early iterations of solar panels. This is like in the 80s or something. Anyways, the, uh, we had a, uh, a sales seminar and, you know, that's one of the wor worst things in life. You'd rather be in a dentist chair than in a sales seminar. But there's one thing the guy said that, that just always stuck with me and I thought, and now I think it's very behavioral. And he said, when you're trying to get a client to do something, don't push him into doing it, pull him into doing it. So at first I was going, what do you mean pull somebody into doing something? But the concept is, uh, rather than trying to get the client to do what you want them to do, draw them your way by, by <coughs> sort of seeding the path in front of them. And I think that that's, uh, uh, clients in finance, especially, you know, when it comes to, by the way, I ran a healthcare company where I used to send nurses to people's homes, you know, uh, doing private duty work mostly uh, all around the States and in, and then in, in Montreal. And uh, I thought I was dealing with families at the highest level of their concern and, you know, emotions. And I mean, it's their dying loved ones. It's, you know, but uh, death and, and health has nothing, is nothing when it comes to money. Money is way more important <laughs> to people than their health and their, so, and their loved ones, so I, it's a very sensitive subject and you have to, you have to really be, uh, to me, uh, um, this push, pull rather than push really applies when it comes to talking to people about their finances. Okay. And that's one thing Mike sure, Jason. should know. There's an interesting Israeli example of the influence of even a small informational tweak. They changed the reporting period a few years back where anything sent to a retail client had to be a minimum of 12 months for the reporting period. And the change in investor behavior in terms of becoming longer term and not only their trading but their overall view was quite interesting. Hmm. And it shows how just a minor piece of information but framing that in a much longer term context backed up some earlier research by Dick Baylor and others in, in that regard mm -hmm. as well. But there's so much that can be done with small tweaks, but <coughs> test them, absolutely test them. It's amazing what you can accomplish by going out and experimenting on a very low cost, low fee way. Thanks for that. Uh, I think that that brings us into the next logical place is when you're designing products, we talked about the communication of it and the marketing, 
but it, lots of folks here are in product departments at, uh, at dealers, asset management firms. If you're designing products, uh, how can you design them and the services that surround them that recognize these behavioral tendencies that we have been speaking about today? Ryan, why don't we start with you on that? Uh, sure. So there's this thing called the risk tolerance questionnaire. Have you guys seen this, used this? I see some smiles and nods. Let me ask, how many people out there like this particular instrument? Interesting. How many use it? <laughs> Decent number, I presume? No, no one uses this? Miraculous. <laughs> there are many of them out there in the Canadian market. Yeah. Say that. Every uh, this fund to fund program in Canada has yeah. So this is, it's an exercise where people read these questions and they don't really understand them and they provide answers. The, the median answers are the ones in the middle. For some of these very complex portfolio problems, they get seven options. They're overwhelmed by 23 numbers and they say, well, I'll choose something in the middle and they go on from there, right? And as though that tells us something about the person. Uh, it's also measured in a very abstract way. So it's, it's some hundred thousand dollars that falls from somewhere that they're making decisions on. And so I think this is a very abstract way of thinking about what a person's risk preferences are. And it turns out it's not a very good measure nor a good guide to try and give a person good financial advice. And so I think what would be a much better way is to understand the context of the person. I think recent advances in information technology allow us to, to be much more tailored to what investors are trying to do. So you can start to say, okay, how much money is this person coming in with? And some people may be coming in with 10,000. And for them, that's a huge amount of money. Others may be coming in with a million and to be able to start to tailor their decisions of gains and losses in terms they understand. So I think that's one thing we can start to do with information technology. And there's other tricks too of thinking about how to represent outcomes to people. So for example, putting lump sums at the end to say, if you do this for the next 30 years, you'll have $1.5 million. And they think, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be super rich. Not taking into account two major things. First, there's inflation. That's not gonna be as much worth as much as they think it is. And second, they're probably going to live that, outlive that. And so by contextualizing it, saying, let's turn that into a way in which people think about it. M a month slice makes a lot of sense. And then do the math for them. We all know how to do the math of controlling for what's going to be inflation. Do that and say, here's the purchasing power of that future cash flow. And I think this kind of contextualization uh, is very useful in helping people make better decisions. Ken, if you were putting a, taking a look at all the products that are out there, uh, how would you design a product that would best help investors avoid some of the poor behavioral tendencies? My fund. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I usually I'm railing against products, especially bank uh, created products, especially those like capital protected and all, you know, there's so many gimmicky kinds of things out there. Yeah. Uh, obviously they sell yeah. and, uh, you know, I think that <clears throat> products have, there's been, it used to be when a client transferred to me, from a broker or from wherever, I would look at their portfolio and I'd see 150 shares of CN and 100 shares of Royal Bank and you know all these things. I'd see positions. Mm -hmm. I rarely <coughs> see positions now. When I get a transfer, and especially from any big bank client, yeah. it's all products. It's all the Royal Bank's this, the, 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 and and it's clear what's going on. They're, these are feed machines. I mean, essentially, because br uh, bank brokers used to charge these three, four hundred dollar tickets and could make money off of transaction costs. Now they can't with all the discount brokers and stuff, so they've had to embed the fees in these products. So I guess <laughs> it's a cynical answer, but it's try and embed those fees as well as you can and make them as hidden as you can possibly make them. And, uh, and I mean, I, you know, otherwise you're, it's just sort of rearranging the deck chairs of these things. They're buying the same things and just, you know, I don't know, I'm, I'm cynical. I, I shouldn't answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> I think you already did. So <laughs> Jason, what about you? I mean, if you were putting products together. The only other one is uh, finding ways, picking up Ryan's point, to address the overconfidence bias. Uh, very, very few people think there's ever a chance of divorce, of a long-term illness, precarious employment, or other factors there. So that so few people are prepared for these types of events. So the contextualizing, either in terms of showing someone aging, looking at different examples of an avatar, there's some good examples around the globe of where avatars can be built in. I'm quite a fan of it. A number of the fintech firms have tried. I think these are ones for uh, taking this, especially with the growing dependence on uh, mobile phones. If I look at the amount of people who are outsourcing their decisions to mobile phones, it needs to be increasingly incorporated into that distribution of information for products. Mm -hmm. Good point. Okay. And then maybe one final uh, class of potential attendee here today, from a regulatory standpoint, 
uh, you know, there are moves afoot from the regulators to try to take this into a, uh, account. We know they've got a role to play in investor protection. <clears throat> How can they do the best job of that by incorporating some of the concepts that we've talked about today? And then perhaps uh, if you can comment, if you're aware of any initiatives that you know that are going on either in Canada or in other jurisdictions where regulators are specifically taking this into account. And Ryan, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, so I think that there, so I've been in several conferences that were regulatory focused. And one of the knee jerk reactions from many of the folks there was framing the question of how can we, how can we make the disclosures better to help people make better choices? Right, so they, they'd, fr they'd teed up the question this way. So it's just a matter of getting the disclosures right. Maybe it's the font or the outline or the formatting of these sorts of things, right? And, and we've done some, uh, building on th these ideas of looking at different ways in which we can represent information, we've tried lots of different ways of representing how expensive different products are. And we, we haven't found yet which way of a disclosure helps. Uh, the answer we find is it doesn't help because people don't read them. Um, they don't, that's not what they're using to make a decision. So I think that it's worth taking a step back and asking, okay, what is the behavior we actually want to try and achieve? And so from a regulatory standpoint, we would like people to stop wasting money by buying products that actually don't do what they think they do. And so, okay, how can we then achieve that? And it's not through the, the method of better disclosures. We haven't found the right phrasing of the instructions or nine point font that really drives home this point to people. So I think there's other things then that can be useful. Uh, nudging people, defaults are extremely useful in getting people to do things that are in their best interest. Uh, that's been one of the, the major accomplishments that comes out of the work of Thaler and others, and this notion of nudge by here's the default option. If you want to change it, you can. Certainly you're right and you're freedom, but this is what we would default you into, and that's a great way to get people to choose better. Ken, you're, you're nodding at that. Yeah. I mean, is nudging a good thing? Is regulators, yes. should they be working on that? Yes, uh, and I, I, I just, uh, I'd, I'd also urge people to read Nudge, uh, you know, to get a really good answer to that question. Uh, the only thing I would add to what um, Ryan said was uh, accountability. If they're, they're, when it's very clear that in studies that when there's clear accountability and it's reinforced and, it's, and people know that they, this is what they will suffer if they do this bad behavior and so on, uh, we get m compliance is, is, you know, much better, much stronger. Mm -hmm. And Jason, I'll give you the last word to you on regulators. I think there's a number of examples around the globe that are quite useful. The UK Behavioral Insights team has this framework called EAST, making things easy, accessible, social, and timely. It's a very, very good approach. And the New Zealand uh, Financial Markets Authority picked this up with a very good one-page overview of how easy is it for someone to access? Is it attractive or is it dense and legal? Is it social? Will their friends be influencing the decision? Will family? Is there a lot of material online? It's a very good guide. It's from the 2016 Behavioral Insights paper that I'd recommend. It's also an intriguing approach, and I know that some people may wonder where I'm going with this, but Hong Kong's Investor Education Center uh, had the standard regulatory thing with the website, the information decent following, but not really significant. They then created the Chin family, which are avatars with uh, families representing everything from children through young adults going out in the workforce, people with older children, and then retirees. Surge in uptake. It's geared around life events, so it's quite timely. It's very easy to use. You go on Hong Kong's website and you're immediately, you have the option to go into the Chin family. And it's really quite fascinating how a conventional regulator set this up and found that there was much more uptake. So I think there's some real opportunities to be creative using what's going on elsewhere in the world. And the last one I'd mention is if any of you uh, need more to read, but go on the Financial Conduct Authority website. There's a number of outstanding papers, starting with the very first one, which is on behavioral economics and behavioral finance, right through to uh, number 26 is outstanding. And for those of you who are policy wonks or market wonks, there's uh, economics for effective regulation, which is a specific one, which is very good, integrating behavioral economics with conventional economics with a variety of other theories as well. And I commend that to any of you. Okay. Just before we circle back to audience questions and then maybe some last ideas from the panel, I wanted to ask about, we, we've been talking in very positive terms about uh, you know, the, the influence and effects of behavioral economics, but I wanted to talk about limitations uh, I mean, are there limits uh, to the benefits of the behavioral approach in general? Any specific areas of behavioral economics that have generated a lot of research without a commensurate gain uh, in practical benefit? 
uh, and maybe even going beyond that, is, is behavioral economics in general a replacement for traditional economic theory, or is it an add-on? I think in, in your answer would be great to uh, hear something like that. Jason, why don't we start with you? There's several areas of interest on this. I start with there's a fabulous debate between Jean Fama and uh, Robert Schiller, uh, who both received the uh, Nobel Prize in 2013. I commend both those papers. It's obviously very difficult to identify a uh, bubble up front. Well, certainly it's timely in terms of the discussion here, and I hesitate to call anything in that regard but overvaluation. But what I would like to talk about is social proof. Uh, a lot of behavioral studies are built around the fact that we look to others either for socially acceptable behavior or as a guide, yet it's quite interesting the full panoply of results. Uh, there are some cases where it's had outstanding results in terms of changing people's behavior. There's some where it's been quite mixed, and then there's some where unintentionally it's encouraged the exact opposite behavior to what was intended. Uh, there's a famous study in a park in the U U.S. where they talked about people uh, removing uh, a piece of wood from the petrified forest. And that led to a sharp uptake in the number of people that went from uh, the low uh, single digits to the high single digits as soon as that campaign started. So when someone uses negative be uh, behavior, you want to be very careful that you're not reinforcing the exact opposite of what you want to achieve. Ken, limits to behavioral economics? <coughs> or you know, um, Steven Pinker, a famous Montrealer who's uh, head of psychology at Harvard now, uh, said, make no mistake about it, our brains have evolved for fitness and, and survivability, not for truth seeking. So it sort of goes back to what Ryan's point about our brains haven't evolved for stock picking. And uh, I, I like to tell my students an example that think of, uh, you think of using your car engine to make toast. You start your car, open the hood, find a nice hot spot on the engine, take your piece of bread, put it there, leave it there for a few minutes, turn it over, it'll work. It'll make you toast, but it's probably not the most efficient the use of your car <laughs> engine, and there's probably better ways of making toast. So that's, so to me, the limitations of, of our, our uh, you know, in terms of behavior, behavioral finance, all it does is it doesn't pretend to have the answers, but it's showing us the limitations, and, and that's a very, very powerful limitation that we're using the wrong machine here. And, which again speaks to algos taking over probably, but you know, it's, uh, uh, that's the, in fact, the criticism, the best criticism of behavioral finance doesn't come from the finance community, it comes from the psychological community, the people who you know, are saying, okay, you're just misidentifying the brain. You're starting on the premise that your brain should be a perfect decision maker. Mm. It, it, it shouldn't be right from the beginning. So you're, you're just, refu it's an axiom, you're, what you're, you're refuting something we should already know. Ryan, anything to add on that? Uh, to, so back to, to your question, which was whether or not, the, the last part of the question is whether or not behavioral economics stands in contrast to traditional mm -hmm. economics. I don't see that at all. And I think that if it's framed in that way, this is going to be counterproductive. Behavioral economics is a natural extension that builds on traditional economics. It takes these notions of rationality and the starting points of these axioms and then starts to expand them. So you can build beautiful theories that say, imagine a person has perfect attention and has all this information. Okay, you can build a model that way. But now let's imagine that the decision agent has limited attention. You can still use this machinery to make very interesting predictions that may actually be closer to how the real world works. And so it's this iterative process of feedback and testing and expanding the model. This isn't a conflict between the two at all. It's just a natural expansion. Uh, in terms of what it provides, it provides tools, the tools that have better predictive capacity in understanding what real people are going to do. And how a tool is used is very much in the hands of who wields it. Casinos know a great deal about how people think about risk. So look at a roulette wheel. And casinos are very kind to put a large overhead that shows you the history of what that roulette wheel has done in the last 20 rolls. <laughs> and people dutifully pay attention to that, looking at it, trying to decide where they should bet next. Right? Just contemplate that for a moment, as if the ball has a memory. <laughs> and they're going to figure out what it's going to do next. right? But the brain is one of the best pattern-finding machines that exists. In fact, it's so good at finding patterns, it finds patterns that aren't even there. Casinos know this, and casinos are exploiting this in a way that actually is consistent with how people think about it, and it gets them to bet more money, which the casinos make a lot more money with. So I mean, I mean these insights are, are very useful, and it depends on whose hands they are. And I think what we're seeing now is a lot of people start to get interested in this, uh, so it's not just left in the hands of casinos and used car salesmen, but that correct actually starting to see in finance and other really important decisions, understanding better what motivates choices and help people choose better. 
Okay. Uh, thanks for that. And let's let's take the opportunity one last time to go to uh, to the audience to see if there are any final questions for the panelists before we uh, turn around and wrap up. Any other questions from the group for today? When I used to teach, I wouldn't let the lecture go on until I had at least three <laughs> questions. <laughs> Me too. There we go. I well, have to be sufficiently, students, sufficiently uh, provocative. Yeah. <laughs> How do you mean? You mean like predicting mass behavior, uh, or group think, or things group like that? There's a whole emerging body of research that our susceptibility to peer pressure and group think is being magnified, not only online but particularly by smartphones, and particularly the case with. We didn't get into this, but the difference in personalities between what I would call an activist, do-it-yourself investor, versus the much larger group, which is a delegator. They tend to be much more passive, focus on system one for behavior. But the example that I would use is the market's prediction of both Brexit and the US election. That combination of complacency and certainty prior to both events was remarkable, given how close the polls were. And yet the group think and herding instinct is very easy because I was susceptible to it as well. So I have to admit I was in shock the next morning. But that fact that the government, would, sorry, the markets, without being experts in politics, had decided this was the likely outcome, I find a fascinating example of a whole series of behavior errors. Any, anything else to add on groups? Do we make better decisions as groups or as individuals? It's interesting, actually, uh, when, when uh, studies have shown uh, that uh, the kinds of questions that Kahneman would ask, you know, in prospect theory, these sort of judgments uh, rather than black or white kind of questions, that mass, the answers of many, the average, it tends to be pretty accurate. But there's the herd mentality. So when you're asking people individually a question, they tend to answer, the average tends to be about right. When, you, when everybody can hear everybody's answers and stuff, then they start to, uh, you know, and you know, of course, those famous <coughs> tests where you have three lines on the board. One's clearly shorter, but everybody's in on it except for one person. Everybody <coughs> votes for another line. And the one who invariably, who's alone and, and the subject of the exam, goes along with the crowd. And in some cases, that person even says, I thought that one was the shorter one. Like, they actually, the, the illusion is that powerful, or the group think, or the power of, you know. And of course, Buffett, who says, you know, be greedy when everyone's fearful, the whole contrarian kind of thing is, uh, Go, get, go against the group generally and you'll do better because the group tends to you know, over, over, overdo whatever it's doing. Okay, thanks for the question. Any others from the group now? Oh, thought of Cyan right there. All right, let's, uh, let's circle back uh, to, to the panelists for a couple of last ideas. And uh, you've thrown out, an, you've all thrown out names and websites and w things like that, but I <coughs> wanted to make sure that everybody went away formally with, with at least a couple of ideas for further insight, any t books, uh, articles, blogs, whatever, that you think would be a great either introduction or ongoing education in the area of behavioral economics, and uh, why don't we start with you on that, Jason? The uh, first one I'd recommend is Smoke, and Art sees uh, the smarter screen. Uh, it really looks at how different our behavior is online, starting from the foundations of behavioral economics and then goes right through the different aspects. Sloan was also quite active uh, in finance himself, so I think that's an excellent one from 2015. Uh, Dilip Solman's The Last Mile, many, many practical examples, everything from the change in people's behavior when they're actually using change in their laundries versus actually having a credit card or some kind of debit right through to the differences with hassle costs for what it means, including aspects of finance. And the third, I would say, is actually uh, our study from 2014 for how you ask the question, the impact of framing, and how it changes people's perceptions of risk. Those would be the three that I would recommend. Okay, thanks. And Ken, I'll go to you as well. I'm gonna assume you're gonna say register in your course. So, <laughs> but let's see, see if we can do anything beyond that. <laughs> oh, I'm, uh, I send out a book list every year. I'm, I'm sort of famous for all the books I recommend uh, to, to everybody who will, even people walking by the street who I don't know. But uh, <laughs> in terms of behavioral finance, I, in fact, when I, McGill finally said, okay, you can teach it, 
first thing I did was I found out who, how many people, who teaches behavioral finance in North America. I sent all of them an email. What's your curriculum? What books do you use? And so on. And I got all these books back. And then I get all the stuff from Wiley and Sons and all the different publishers because they know I teach behavioral stuff. So I get all the current you know, textbooks. And I find most of what's being used in schools to be dry and boring. And this is such an interesting subject. So I decided to go at it from a different way. And I actually have students, many of you may know this book, The Power of Habit. Uh, it sounds like a self-help book and so on. And, and when I first read it, it, it I, I was sort of like, should I let my students, you know, should I be you know, promoting this kind of a book? But it is a wonderful book to explain how system one is formed. And the other book that I recommend and that I teach in my course is um, The Righteous Mind. And uh, it's uh, Hate is the author, H-A-I-D-T. And uh, The Righteous Mind gives us, to me, a decision before you talk about it. And really, my course should be called Decision Making, because that's really what, what I focus on, financial decision making. Um, the macro, to all of us, if you look at you know, how you pick stocks, you have to have a macro of what's going on in the world. Our individual macro are our values and our morals, because how can you make a decision be, with, without sort of considering the, the, the moral backdrop? And of course, what's going on, again, I'm an American, you know, with the orangutan in the White House, the, the, <laughs> the, the, the division amongst people, the division, you know, and the, the infighting, and I mean, it's, it's exactly that. It's, it's people who have a different moral framework, and so we, look, we call them depl deplorables, and we think of them as complete deplorables with it, by their behaviors, and they you know, have all sorts of names for us, and we, it seems like we can't even meet. And so I think not enough uh, um, work or, and, and, and young people and people who are in, in, you know, aren't looking at the moral backdrop to this. And, and by the way, there's many great books on, uh, on um, sort of uh, moral background. Um, uh, I can't think of the names now, but there's a guy who teaches at Harvard, a law school, uh, what's his name, Sendell. Um, it's called just, I think, morality. And anyway, there's, but I think that's an area that, that could be studied, the sort of the individual moral backdrop and how people's morals are formed. And by the way, according to Haight, uh, we have this, the same dichotomy like system one, system two. He calls it an elephant and a human riding on top of the elephant. And he says that the human riding on top of the elephant is more like a, a lawyer who works for the elephant or a press secretary you know, who works for the elephant. So reason in the form of morality is, is not to change the mind of the, the elephant or the, our sort of subconscious morality, it's to justify it. And, and so, and that goes along, if you read Kahneman and Haight at the same time, it's a, it's a beautiful sort of synergy there. Thank you for that, Ken. And Ryan, we'll give the last word to you on further resources. Well, it, it's already been mentioned, Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman is a, is a brilliant book. It's extensive, but it really is an, a good summary of the field that he worked in, contributed to, and helped start. Uh, the other one that stands out to me is the book Moneyball, which I presume many of you have heard and see. And this, you, you talk about these sorts of you know, persistent irrationalities. How can there be persistent mispricing of something? That should go away. Arbitrage should get rid of that very quickly. There's a lot of pressure. I mean, it, if you give people enough time, you know, markets need a little bit of time and they certainly need incentives, but once you have those two ingredients, the irrationalities are going to go away. It's just a matter of you know, waiting a couple months. And this isn't the case. And so Moneyball, I think, provides a beautiful example in depth of how there is persistent misunderstanding and mispricing of value in players over time and how that was only overcome by a con confluence of better data and a willingness to ask questions. How do you know you know? How are you sure? and to go actually look. And so I, I think when I, you can read that book and it's not just about baseball. It's about how do we understand complex systems? What's the right way to think about them? How do we make predictions? And how do we know we know? So that I, for further reading, I certainly recommend those and there, there are many others as I'm, I'm sure you cover in your course. Is the movie as good? Is it good enough to just do the movie with Brad Pitt? <laughs> <laughs> the movie's excellent, but the, the book itself is certainly worth the time. And thinking through it as a metaphor, because at the end of it, it's, it's great. I mean, I like baseball, and it's a good book about that. But this isn't about baseball. This is a book about people misunderstanding the environments they're in and persistently misunderstanding it for 40 years, yeah. even though they have very clear incentives and to get it right. And the stickiness of that. The uh, sticky, yeah. And so they tell each other stories about, oh yeah, we're, we're right, we know we're right. It's always been that way, we know we're right, and they're not. All right, well on that note, where we're really uh, pressed up on the, uh, the ending time here, so uh, thanks very much to all of the panelists, to Ken and to Jason and to Ryan for uh, sitting down with us today and, and having this discussion. Thank you especially for attending today's executive forum. 
Uh, later on today, for those of you who are registered, you will receive an email link to a survey. Uh, we do value the feedback that we receive at, at, at Morningstar on these forums, so please do take the time to fill in that survey, and you will see that later on today from the email that you registered uh, with. So that concludes the formal part of our, our, our panel discussion today. Uh, however, Ryan Murphy, our Morningstar Director of Behavioral Sciences, will provide a presentation on rethinking advisors as behavioral coaches. That's going to be a 20-minute or so presentation. Uh, so while Ryan is setting up, please do uh, take the opportunity for the next couple of minutes to stretch your legs, maybe uh, refresh your beverage. Uh, I do want to make one more plug. Uh, we do a series of these executive forums. Uh, in 2018, coming up in February of, of next year, the next executive forum that will come to Montreal will address the disruption of technology in the financial industry, so we look forward to talking to you about that. So please, for those of you uh, who would like to stick around, we would love uh, for you to uh, hear what Ryan has to say on the uh, advisors as behavioral coaches. Otherwise, please enjoy, enjoy your day, and thank you for attending today. Thanks. I communicate is that financial advising is much more than this. It's, certainly it's quantitative, but there's a lot more to it. But when you look at how finance is structured, how it's taught, how people think about economics, uh, many times you know, through their formal training for the first six years or so, there is this very simple idea of how people make decisions. It's been referred to here as homo economicus, this perfectly rational decision agent that responds consistently to incentives and makes appropriate trade-offs. Rational people think both about the present and the future, and they anticipate likely consequences of their actions on their material well-being. And moreover, they make choices to maximize their current and future expected utility. Right? Simple. Very useful as a starting point for a model, but how many of you identify with this? When you think about people you know, when you think, you get, think about people you would give financial advice to. And so our models are much simpler in some ways and much more complicated in others. And so what we're starting to do is think about, well, how can we start to build models in a rigorous way that capture the way real people think about these issues, how they make trade-offs, how they envision risk, and so on. How this manifests itself in terms of financial planning is there's this process for which a financial planner and clients go through where they develop a very solid plan, go through all the numbers, the due diligence, and then their clients are told to be calm, collected, and be in this for the long term, right? And this is it. Everyone's done. You just have to hang on. They check in with you 30 years later and everything else is okay, right? Not so much. Let's play a little game. For this, I need a victim or a volunteer. Any takers? Getters are reticent. Here's the rules of the game. We're not gonna do this for real money, but imagine I endow you with 100 currency units. This is how much money I give you. And this is a multi-stage investment problem. So in each stage, you can decide to invest any portion of your holdings on a positive expected option. On each stage, the probability of a win is 0.6. Draws are independent, and that probability stays the same. So this is a very simple kind of risky problem. If there's a win, which happens about 60% of the time, then whatever was invested on that stage is doubled and returned to the decision maker. Otherwise, it is lost. And we'll do this eight times in total. And so your earnings are whatever amount of money you have at the end of these eight stages. Or perhaps bankruptcy, in which I just make fun of you for the remaining stages of the game because you've bet it and lost all of it. Okay? That's it. That's the entire test. Does everyone understand the rules of what this thing is? A little bit like a, a little bit like roulette. You bet on the it's a little bit like roulette, but a casino would be yeah. insane to give you this particular yeah, game, right? Yeah, you're getting pretty good odds, 0.6. So it's not certain. There's still some quantified uncertainty. But So there's this old saying in finance, it takes money to make money. And if you want to just risk nothing, you could just keep your 100 units until the end. You would have that, basically guaranteed. But it also guarantees very low returns. If you risk too much, it could lead to potentially great outcomes. You could get really lucky, have a streak of good outcomes, or it could actually be potentially disastrous. There's a lot more variance. So the question is, the crux of the decision is, what is a good decision here? Now, one of the distinctions I want to highlight that we have is not just talking about decisions, like what would you feel you should do on a scale of one to five, but let's actually do this. Let's actually go through and have a person make decisions. So that's why I was asking for a person to do this. 
I don't want to just talk about decisions. Let's see what happens. All right, so who's volunteering for me? Excellent. So who's this brave soul I see? Ah, good. All right, so on this first stage, and for those of you who haven't volunteered, what would you do? How much of your stake do you want to hold? So we start with 100 units, but you can think of that as 100,000. That makes it more interesting for you. Same idea. How much do you want to wager? 50%. No. You say no? <laughs> no, I will not let you. All right, 50%. What happens? OK, you won. OK, good outcome. Now you have 150 units. What do you want to do now? So you want to continue to bet 50% of your holdings. OK, so you're betting 75 units. Ooh. I asked you, and you didn't say anything. <laughs> you can ask the market for a do-over, and you can see what the answer is. You are now in the third stage. You have won one, you have lost one. So what do you want to do now? Uh, Regrets aside. Whatever you have left, I don't have my uh, AXP. Anymore. Okay. So you have 75 units left. All right. Let's do 50. You want to 50, 50 units. Okay. 50 units. So that is 67%. No, no. Yeah, which is 67% of your total holdings. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. You won. You're back. Whew, right? Now, I presume you're having some emotional reactions in this experience. And for those of you, when people do this, when they're in control of it, I mean, their pupils dilate, their blood flow changes in their skin. I mean, they react. Our brains are wired to react to these changes. Big green bar, you're a winner. You must be an investment genius, right? <laughs> Big red bar, ugh, the markets don't like me. OK. So what do you want to do now? You are. You're on a roll of one. <laughs> okay, 50 percent. Okay, 50 units. 40 percent. Okay, you won again. Now what? So you're ratcheting back a little bit in how much risk you're exposing yourself to. OK. Turned out well. You won. So what do you want to do now? 30 units again. 30 units again. So that would be the interface is rounding to the nearest percentage. So 14%, 29 units, a loss. Two more to go. 30 units now, OK? OK, you won. So you have a holdings of 206, having started with 100, not so bad. This is, my last this is it. This is the last one. Six units. Six units. Six units. Interesting. I think I see your thought process for this, right? Yeah, you double, you've locked in these games. And you got it. OK, so 212. All right? It's easy, right? <laughs> so if we take models of decision making and we start to look at what people's risk preferences are in this environment, we can have lots of different models, even models that have varying utility of different degrees of risk aversion, different degrees of loss aversion. But what we're interested in here is the stability of those preferences over time. So we can imagine lots of different models, but how much risk a person takes on one stage should be highly similar to how much risk they take on the next stage, that there's this consistency within how much risk exposure they have, which in this particular task is manifested by the percentage of their portfolio put against this risky prospect. So this is a theoretical prediction of what we would expect people to do. And this is a theoretical prediction even if we took into account that different people had different risk preferences. Do you think this is what real people do? Is this what you did? No. So this is a subject from an experiment. They change around. They're changing their risk exposure, sometimes taking less, sometimes taking more, sometimes seeing a run, a run of one, right? Changing how they bet. This is another subject, okay? 
Now, when I first saw this experimentally, I was like, this is chaos. This person was just you know, messing around in the experiment, not taking it seriously, but there's a pattern there. This is a person who has some sort of cyclical risk exposure. So they keep upping their risk exposure as they get lucky, and then they hit a particular level, and they lock in. And then they go in the market a little bit further, and then they, and they take, take, take more risk, like a sawtooth. And then they pull back if they get lucky. This is a highly inefficient strategy. This person is leaving a lot of money on the table. But part of what it highlights also is that people's risk preferences matter, but the stability of those preferences matter. It turns out that the optimal policy in this particular task is to set your risk exposure at a certain percentage of your portfolio and leave it alone. Set it and just walk away. Push the next button. But it's really hard to do. It's really hard to sit still. And this task draws that out for people. Some people have an easier time doing it. Others are very reactive. In part because our brains are wired to react. Things happen. There are voices in the market that sometimes yell louder about these sorts of things, uh, not necessarily wisely, that people start to respond to. And when people have these experiences, they see that big red bar, they want to do something. People want to do something. Clients say, hey, you have to do something. Just sitting there doesn't seem like a smart thing. When in reality, in this environment, that's exactly what would be long-term best interest. So this undermines performance. And this is what we were refer referencing before in the behavioral gap. So Morningstar has done this study for decades now. Um, Russ Kinnell and others looking at as there's a big difference between how much returns are for investments versus investors. This is seminal research by Odin and Barber showing what is the average return for people based on how often they go in and change holdings in their portfolio. So if a person didn't do anything, left it perfectly constant, they'd be that red bar, just S&P tracker. And then these blue bars are quintiles of how active these different traders are, the least active being on the far left. People who just leave it alone have pretty good returns, like the market. But people who go in and fiddle with their portfolio, who nudge it, change it around, have worse and worse performance. And this is substantial. I mean, this is people giving up on an annual basis close to I mean, 10 percentage points or so. Yes. And, and uh, declining interest rates. Uh, make the same argument about almost any interest in people that have really great. OK. This has been replicated. So I, your point is, well, this is confined to a particular market period, which is right before the 2000.com bubble. I agree. But this general stylized finding seems to be recurring over and over again. People who mess around more with their portfolios do worse. Do you have the numbers from the last decade, for example? I'd have to go dig through some recent studies. I don't have those in this slide, but this is a seminal study, and, and the finding is persistent. We have yet to find a market environment where people are acting wiser than the S&P 500 on average. At least I haven't seen it. All right, so the thinking is, how can you help people stick with a calm collected in it for the long-term investing? And there's this notion of, of behavioral coaching which comes up. And studies have looked at the value of this, and it's one of the more valuable things that advisors can do for people as they make decisions. Let me show you results from one study we ran where we asked people, what qualities do you look for in a financial advisor? So the stuff, there's a lot of data here. I'll just walk you through a little bit of it. The stuff on the left is giving people lots of attributes and saying, how valuable do you see these different things from a financial advisor? And what people are interested in is someone who will help them reach their financial goals or someone who has relevant knowledge. These are very high-ranking things. When you ask people you know, whether it's the least important things, helps me stay in control of my emotions. So that's, that is the lowest-ranked thing, which is really surprising because that's one of the most valuable things that advisors can do. And I think that's a communication failure from the industry and from us as well, not being able to explain this better. And that's something I'd like to work on in the next year because I think that this is a profound misunderstanding of where the value comes from in financial advising. People don't even know this. So I think that's something to work against. So the, the crux of the bigger problem is that people can be their own worst enemy. They tend to have two minds going on that are in conflict with each other, one fast, one slow. People often misunderstand where the value of good financial advice comes from and what behaviors actually drive success. And what I want to do is walk, to th walk through some concrete tips 
that can help real people make better choices. Okay? Let me pause there. Are there any questions before I go on? All right, so a couple concrete ideas. Things, oh, in the back. What I did was we were playing that Sega game. Yes. Was not that different when I was managing money. In other words, I was making investments on behalf of the client based on risk tolerance, all those great things. When I got to a certain level of mm -hmm. Okay. So that my core assets would continue to grow Got it. irrespective of what the market did. Okay. So two comments back on that. One, this strikes me as very sensible, but what you're doing there is not maximizing the growth rate of money. You're maximizing the probability of hitting some wealth level as a goal, which is an excellent thing to do if that's what the clients want. Okay, so that makes sense to me. Maybe we can take this additional discussion offline because there's, there's some interesting nuances there as well. What I think though, the, the other point I wanna highlight is that you had a very clear principled reason for doing what you're doing. When people go in and start to change their risk exposures in portfolio, I doubt they have the same kind of calculated principled view that you just articulated. Here's why we're doing this. It's often they think the market is going in a bad way, they have these very strong feelings, and it's those feelings I think that push people to do dumb things. So here's a couple tips, things to suggest and maybe to try and nudge people to behave better. One of the most useful things is automated behavior. So they automate what their choices are going to be into the future. So this has been one of the drivers in the increase in savings rate. Millennials now are saving more than the generation before them. And the reason isn't because they're smarter about money or because financial literacy has finally kicked in. It's because there are these automated procedures that are put into place. They are defaulted into participating in 401ks and that's driving savings behavior. And it has a huge effect on how many people actually save money just based on whether or not the enrollment is automatic. That I think is very powerful. One of the things we're working on now is this notion called goals-based risk, which is a different approach to financial planning that doesn't look at benchmarks but focuses very much on what people's goals are. And so this is useful to start to show people in concrete terms what is the trade-off between the amount of volatility they have and their current savings rate. So you can show people, look, if you contribute this much more, you could have a portfolio that still serves your long-term interests, reach your goal, but has a smoother ride in getting there. It helps make explicit what these trade-offs are. So risk tolerance questionnaires get at this by asking people how they feel about volatility for returns, but nobody has any idea what that really means. Tools like this are interactive, and they do the math for people and actually show what kind of trade-off that is but does so very much within the context of their plan for them with their goals at the center point. Change the narrative. So when people start to see a down market, they could think this is a good time to panic. And so how do you change what that belief is? Well, there's different approaches, but one is this notion from value-driven investing in which this is a great potential for being able to buy things at a discount. When everyone else is panicking, now's the time to buy. And having people understand and buy into that narrative is useful, and this is Warren Buffett, his kind of approach, this contrarian approach to investing. Helps people understand what they should be doing when the markets act in ways that they're not expecting. Help people prepare for the inevitable. 
So there's going to be volatility. Anyone who's a long-term investor knows that in the next 30 years, there's going to be substantial ups and downs. So there's this old Greek mythology here. Uh, Odysseus uh, knows that he would be too tempted by the sirens. So he, has, uh, he puts in earplugs so that he can't hear them and orders his men to tie him to the mast of the ship. They all have earplugs. He actually doesn't, he's the one who doesn't wear earplugs. I'm sorry, everyone else wears earplugs so he can hear them but can't do anything. So what he's doing here essentially is his cruel rational self is dictating what action set his, his self is going to be when he's actually in the heat of the moment. And so this provides a nice idea then where you have people when they're making their financial plans and their cool, calm, collected selves, they write a letter to their future selves. And this letter is useful for advisors to be able to show clients when the markets start to really gyrate. So this is the two minds I was talking about. This is the cool, calm, collected mind writing a letter to the future self who's going to be scared. Here's what the right thing to do is. An additional idea is try and nudge people into longer term thinking, longer term time horizons. That investing is not a week to week or quarter to quarter activity. This is a 20 to 30 year activity. I think that's very useful. But I'm also mindful that the ways in which tools are used in the industry doesn't help with this. So let me show you one way in which a person's portfolio is represented. You may recognize what company this is from, right? This seems like a horrible way to represent a person's portfolio and like it's fodder for people doing dumb things. Okay, first of all, what are all the big red numbers? Losses, right? What's the time period for this? One day. Why would we possibly show people one day returns if we want them to think as long-term investors? Okay. Second, why do we break up the portfolio into all of its constituent parts? A good diversified portfolio is always going to have parts of it that go down. So when people look at this, what's the first thing they see? Where does the eye track immediately? Yeah, the big red ink, which we make a nice, big, very visible sort of thing. And that's immediately drawn to the losses. People are already hypersensitive to losses. And now you've created a tool to make that even more so, to amplify this bad habit. Yeah? This is your portfolio portfolio. But to actually break it down into its big constituents is almost a battleship. Why not go even further and show every single stock shall, shall buy every single bond? That doesn't strike me as a constructive way to move forward on it. I agree. There you go. Yeah. Okay. But this is currently done in practice a lot. Lots of different firms represent like that. What's the first number in the whole thing? The index. Which one? The Nasdaq. Why? Why would you possibly want someone to pay attention to what the Nasdaq did today? This is just a. Been outperforming recently. Who cares? If you're trying to get someone as a long term investor for their portfolio, I think this is a bad way to do it. I think they're going to start chasing performance and benchmarks. I think they're going to start using the wrong comparison metrics. I think a much better way to represent a portfolio's performance would be something like this. If we really are long-term investors and we believe in that as a principle, keep the x-axis in those terms. This x-axis here is a time horizon that spans 30 years. This is the person's life cycle as an investor. Value is represented on the y-axis. Shows their starting wealth, and these little blips you see look like massive market movements in the moment, but in the grand scheme of things, they're quite small. This is a better way to frame it. What number matters? Given your current contribution rates and timeline, and what our projected market performance is, you have a 95% chance of hitting your goal. This is a better way. This is designing a feedback mechanism to tell a person when they look in their portfolio, how am I doing, such that it would compel them to actually do the right things. That's the number that matters. Am I on target? What can I do to change that? You can make bigger contributions. Contributions are one of the best predictors of people reaching, reaching their financial goals. So this is now designing for two minds. Clearly, it's driven by a lot of numerical computation in the background, but with recognition that people will sometimes see and pay attention to the wrong things. It doesn't make sense to put it right in front of their noses. So these are some very simple ideas, and to echo Warren Buffett again, these, it's simple, but it's not easy to do. I think that this is the challenge. Part of the value that comes from good financial advice is starting to get into the psychology of what that means, and sometimes the contrarian psychology of other, everyone else is doing this. That doesn't mean you should change what you're doing. You're on track, stay the course. And this is the, the psychology of helping people make better decisions. Okay, those are the key points I wanted to cover.
This is indemnification. That is my contact email there, and I'm certainly all ears to get any feedback or questions, comments, or criticism. So thanks for your attention. I should hope not, but I think that good advisors are going to have to recognize what robo can't do well. So I think in terms of stock picking, in terms of portfolio development, these sorts of things can be commoditized and put into computer algorithms that are just going to be faster and better, more efficient at it. But this notion that advisors can help people understand what they want to accomplish, why they're doing this, help them through this process, I think this is necessary. I think it's that human engagement that is actually what's going to be driving the value that people can get out of investing. So that, I think, is going to be a little bit of a shift in the role from picking stocks and building portfolios to helping people plan and stay on track. Uh, but no, I don't see that as being replaced at all. Yeah. I've only heard informal feedback on this. So this was put out from Morningstar into uh, packets uh, in the last year or so. And I talked with a couple of advisors at a conference I was at uh, yesterday, and, and she said that she was doing this, and she found it extremely useful. And the um, clients are receptive? I think some clients are receptive. That was her take, that some were receptive. I don't think this is for everyone. Others might find this to be you know, kind of a foolish exercise. But she had a story of a couple people uh, for whom she was doing this, and it was very useful to reorient the discussion from when they were coming in. They wanted to change something because they, I think it had to do with the election cycle. And this was done before. And so what that helped reorient the person is, yeah, you know, try and calm down the, the volume of the, the recent elections and stay focused on what really matters. But to answer more pointedly to answer your question, I, this is preliminary data. We're still developing these ideas. So it'll be some time before we have uh, controlled experiments to put in front of people and show you those results. All right, well, great. Thank you very much. Um, if you want to chat, I'm more than happy to stay around.